Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. We're going to look at uh, Romans 3, verses 7 to 8, where Paul clearly says in the King James Bible, let's start there, uh, for if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie and his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And we had someone, uh, when I quoted that saying, as Paul is justifying uh, lying for the gospel as being no sin at all, he said, I was a liar. And uh, I'm going to show you that's not true uh, in a second here, but I want to show you what he said. And these are some of his slides from his uh, episode. His name is Giga Chan. He says, dude, you're a total liar, and I suspect you're a Jesuit agent, which I am not. Uh, in in I in detail refuted you on Romans 3, 7. No, he didn't. That you claim says he is admitting he lies to win people and justifies it. You are the one with no shame to repeat this after you have been clearly shown to be an error. Totally false. I provided him a complete explanation and he didn't respond. That's where we are at the moment. And he's uh, falsely accusing me and I've given him a chance to respond. It's been two days. He never responds and so on. And he's going to rely on what's called the easy to read version for why he believes what he does and his easy to uh, read version. Let me just show you here. Easy to read version. I've never even heard of this version, just so you know. Uh, it has all, it has, a, uh, how many words does it add? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words it adds that aren't in the text. <laughs> totally made up. Totally made up. I'm going to show you what they actually say. And it takes away two words that are there, that are over here. Two words were here and not. So it's, 10 words added, two words gone, 12 total words to make it come out to be the way he has been deceived. He, this man, Giga, has been deceived, and I told him that. You've been deceived by mistranslations, and I haven't heard back. So I don't, and I told him, take a look at the, the uh, Mouncy Transliteral, and you'll get a better idea. So now I just want to show you something. In order to understand why he got deceived is one of the things people have to do is they've got to add these words here, which are not in the King James, as you'll see, and you'll see why. And then uh, they've got to change this into a comparison, and I'm going to explain why that's a comparison. It would be the same to say. So if, once you've added this, some might say X, and, and it would be the same as saying Y. So X and Y are similar to each other. And I wrote him back, and I also said, if what you're saying is true, the, the uh, Paul means to be saying that what's in verse 7 is the same as in verse 8, then you have to face the fact that uh, Paul says in verse eight that whoever teaches that let good uh, good thing uh, let's do evil so good may come if they're subject to damnation since Paul has equated that to what is in verse seven he would be damning anyone who says when I lie it's really for God's glory and and therefore I've committed no sin so he would be condemning himself because we've seen in First Corinthians nine for a fact Paul says I act like a Jew I act like I'm under the law around those who are under the law. And I act like I'm not under the law when I'm around those who are not under the law. And I do this to save some. So he's pretending to be. And, and, and when he says, I, I, I act like I'm under the law when I'm around those who are under the law, he specifically says, but I'm not under the law. So he's claiming the law of God has been abrogated for himself, 1 Corinthians 9. But he acts like he's under the law around those who believe the law still applies. And therefore, he is pretending to be law compliant when it's a deception. It's a f fraud on the person who's listening. And we we expose that in the prior, the just prior episode. So, but I want to show you, and, and so I want to step back and just do the translation first and you can, you'll get it. And then you'll go, oh, well, this is obvious what's going on. So notice this, in order to make this all work, you have to lie and put in all these words. Then you got to lie and take the words that are out there, the two words, and you got to put these seven words in. And what is what is the intent? The original words are antithesis. See this? The real words are not rather or in Greek and not say. And what he's really saying, I am not saying. So just so you can understand, this is the proposition. So in, in, in Greek thought, in order to convey an idea, we, we or the Greek writers would use antithesis. And I'm going to show you a, a, a Wikipedia article on that, which is very good. And so when when Paul says, and not rather, he's doing that in antithesis to the first proposition. So he's trying to prove the first proposition is true, but the second one is false. See, they're not comparisons. Comparison would be, you know, A is like B, and therefore B is justly condemned. That's what it says. Let us do evil, they, they, uh, the good may come. Whose damnation is just? Those who teach this, they are justly sent to hell. And if that's true for 
proposition B, then proposition A would mean by comparison, if they're truly alike, then whoever teaches what Paul says is really is coming from Paul. And if the truth of God has more abounded through my life, there was glory, why am yet, yet I am judged a sinner, Paul would be condemning himself, sending himself to damnation. So, so erasing the words, not rather, these key two words, it's an important contrast, creates the antithesis between A and B. So A can be true, but B can be false and be subject to damnation, see? So the true proposition as if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why am I yet also judge a sinner? The false proposition, I'm not rather saying, that's what he's saying, I am not rather saying, as we slanderously have been reported as saying, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Whoever says that is justly damned. So he's clearly saying proposition B is false. And the way he proves proposition A is actually to put, put these in antithesis and say, see, see how I can condemn absolutely those who say do evil that good may come. But I can tell you when I'm actually lying for the good of the gospel, that's actually no sin at all. So, you know, he puts that off to one side. That's called antithesis. And that's how he saves his first proposition A in verse 7. So this is why you've got to know classical Greek writing. You've got to know antithesis and contrast. This is a strong tool of, of, of Greek Rhetoric and rhetoricians used it and were trained. Lawyers, we should study it. We, I make it a hobby of mine. I studied symbolic logic and you can see and learn all these things. And so a comparison is completely different than a contrast or antithesis. So here I want to now break it down a little bit better so you can see it in the Greek. Okay, and so there's a little change here by Mr. Mouncey that I don't like some of his changes, but that's it's minor stuff. But if my lie of God's truth, not truthfulness. And if you go down to Mr. Mouncey's own dictionary, aletheia means truth here, love of truth, sincerity. It isn't even truthfulness anywhere. So I think he's spinning it a little bit. But, you know, it's okay to push out a word a little bit. But I, I think what we need to do is keep the word there, truth, because th there is only one other argument that you can consider is, is Paul... Uh, trying to say my gospel truth, okay? And so th th I think it's obvious that that's what he really means, and he's not saying God's characteristic for telling truth. God God doesn't even have that characteristic in that sense. He cannot lie. He says, I cannot lie. That's in uh, Leviticus. He says, I'm not a man that I can that I can lie. So he, God can, it's not even something he has a trait for. He, he, he can't, his whole being is tied up with truthfulness. He is truth. Like Jesus said, Speaking for God, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you cannot have God even, you know, you, we don't look at God and go, you know, can he be truthful or not? No, he is truth. <laughs> he is the, the epitome of truth. And God dwelled in Jesus, and that's why he could say that. So I disagree with Mr. Mr. Mouncey there. Not material, really, for my purposes or proving what the verse means, but I just want you to know we can have disagreements in translations that are legitimate. And, and notice here, it's all first person. He's not saying someone else said this. But if by my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? It's a rhetorical question. Okay, what does a rhetorical question mean? It means he's implying it's not a sin to lie for the good of the gospel. And he clearly justifies that in 1 Corinthians 9, as we saw in the last episode. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not, I, I believe Paul is uninspired, particularly because he teaches these things. Whether he's going to hell or not is the real crux of this problem. If you translate uh, verse 7 by adding all these words here, some might say, and then equate that then to uh, this proposition about, you know, let's sin so that good may come. And, and Paul himself says those people who teach that are damned. Well, then you've just let Paul damn himself because he clearly teaches what he's saying in verse 7 is uh, is clearly, unequivocally in 1 Corinthians 9. You can pretend all day long you don't see it, but it's clear that it is. You know, I, pre I, I act around those who are under the law as if I'm under the law, even though I'm not under the law. That is pretension. That is fraud. That is a charlatan for God. He's claiming because it's for God, it's all justified. It's not a sin. That's But that's, I don't agree with him, okay? I am free to agree with him because I... Do not trust that Paul is from God for the reasons we've stated here in numerous other passages. But in order to assess Paul, you need to know what he is actually saying. These people up here, the, and I will say unequivocally, are lying. 
They are adding 10 words and they're taking out two. They've changed 12 total words to make it sound and defraud this poor man, Giga, who doesn't know Greek, doesn't know how to look it up. All the Gentiles are being defrauded by people systematically. And Giga's, Giga is just one of millions of fraud, people who've been defrauded. Now ask yourself, well, okay, let me finish the proposition here. Let me finish the translation. Verse eight. Now, uh, Mouncey puts in here, and why not say, no, no, no. He's saying, if I, by my lie, wh why am I a sinner? Now, the, the subject has to be I. It's going to be now a contrast. And I do not say. So the word not is modifying I. My, my, excuse me, my is over here. See that? And I still being condemned as a sinner. So, and why, the implication is I, and I, excuse me, not why. And I do not say, as some slanderously claim, that we are saying. See, it's he's done two antitheses. So the in, the antithesis begins here in verse seven against the prior verse, and he uses the antithesis. He it's like he underscores it as some slanderously claim we are saying. So if there was any ambiguity of what he meant in these first two words, he takes it away by saying, as some slanderously claim that we are saying. So he's clearly saying, I do not say the following words that are coming up. Let us do evil so the good may come of it. And Paul then says, their condemnation, their damnation is well deserved. Those who teach you, and, and, and if you look at the grammar, Hodge points out, this is actually Paul is referencing those who teach this doctrine, that you can do evil, that good may come. They are justly damned. And I'll show that to you uh, later. So how do we know the truth of this passage? You have to know Greek antithesis. So, so let me just, Pull back out here and show you an article on antithesis. All right. So in Greek translation, you must know about the principle of antithesis because it's how you can translate. In other words, it was very common to state two propositions that are antithetical to each other in the same passage so that the meaning would be clearer. So in John 3, 36, for example, John the Baptist says for uh, he uses the word pisto as so uh, as many as believed in him X Y Z. That's how it could be translated. That's what the King James did. But the next word is in contrast or antithesis. It says, "But all those who epatheo or the word there only means disobey." So it says, and "Those those who disobeyed the Son, the wrath of God remained upon them." So now you have to go back and say, "Oh, what did he mean by pisto as?" Oh. That doesn't mean believe in, it means obey. So those who obeyed unto him should have eternal life, but those who disobeyed him are subject to the wrath of God. So now you can figure out what was the intended meaning of the word pisto eis in the first part of that sentence. So we're studying that in the, uh, we have a whole series on how do you translate the word pisto in the Gospel of John, just giving you an example. And so that's a key to unlock all other 30 times that the word pisto eis is used in the entire book of John. But I digress. But that's just an example of how you use antithesis to express ideas so that we can know what what proposition A was in the sentence and what proposition B, which is the antithesis of that sentence in the same sentence. So let, let's read this definition here. Antithesis, setting in opposites against one, one another, or placing them, is used in writing or speech either as a proposition that contrasts with or reverses some previously mentioned proposition or when two opposites are introduced together for contrasting effect, like I just gave you as an example. Antithesis can be de defined as a figure of speech involving a seeming contradiction of idea, words, clauses, or sentence within a balanced grammatical structure. Parallelism of expression serves to emphasize opposition of ideas. So in the example we have in uh, verse 7, they're in parallel because they are uh, uh, ideas that seemingly are similar, but Paul's going to show they're extremely opposite. One is damnable and the other is no sin at all. That's his whole point. That's the contrast. And if you erase that by trying to make them similar to each other, you've just ruined his structure and you've made him damn himself. So you cannot, you cannot corrupt the text without corrupting his meaning and backfiring. It backfires on all the people who do this. You're, you're, pointing the aim at the first sentence as seven verse seven is it also a damnable uh, 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 heresy <laughs> which I, I think it's still I think it's wrong but does Paul is Paul gonna go to hell for the for simply lying for the gospel 
Well, I think it's a, it's a sin you can repent from, and you it's not like blasphemy, which is unpardonable. So I just want to make that clear. <clears throat> so now, according to Aristotle, the use of an antithesis makes the audience better understand the point the speaker is trying to make. So let me be clear here, everybody. Paul used this antithesis so that you wouldn't make the mistake that people are making. <laughs> so he's showing these in complete contrast to each other. So proposition A, verse 7, is completely opposite from verse Eight, and the way he made it clear is he demarcated it. He says, and I do not say, as some slanderously say, we say, da, 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 da. That could not be more clear. These are two divergent propositions, seven and eight. Okay. Uh, further explain the comparison of two situations or ideas makes cho choosing the correct one simpler. So what is he saying is the correct one? He wants you to accept proposition verse 7 and reject proposition verse 8. So you don't do evil so good may come. So we don't do evil so more grace happens. But we do do good. We do the right thing when we lie for God's word, for God's uh, gospel to be truth, to be spread. Because, why, you know, when you're doing that, you're not even a sinner. He says rhetorically, like he doesn't, it's like a proposition he doesn't think you even have to defend. It's so obviously true. Now, why would he think that? I just want to pause here. Is there's a social construct you need to know? The Pharisees were very much into casuistry, which means the the defense of deceiving and lying for purposes of spreading their their message. And that's why Jesus calls them what? Hypocrites. He that was his number one label he, he threw around their necks. Hypocrites means people who pretend to be something that they aren't pretend to be righteous, but in, inside they're what? Dead man's bones. He said this about them. And Paul is defending hypocrisy because that was the Pharisee way of doing things. Paul has seemingly never read any of the Gospels because he would have been ashamed to say anything like this. He is defending hypocrisy for the Gospel. And that's what the Pharisees taught. Paul teaches a lot of things the Pharisees taught, and I've told you before. Where did he get this idea that the angels gave God's law in Galatians 3.19? And therefore, the entire book of Moses is not given by Yahweh to Moses, it's given by angels. And that's why he tells the Galatians, why are you being foolish about keeping Sabbath? You know, that's from the weak and beggarly uh, elements, and the word elements in Greek also means the word celestial beings. So why do you want to listen to those who are weak and beggarly celestial beings, meaning the angels? That's who he is insulting in Galatians 3. So where is he getting that from? From the Pharisees. Is it a true doctrine that the God did not give the law, it was given by angels? No, that is equally false. So Paul has the false idea that angels gave uh, the uh, the law to to Moses, and he's got the false idea here in Galatians in, in Romans three verse seven that it's okay to lie for the gospel. It's no sin. That's what he's been trained to believe. It's never a sin to lie to advance God's truth. Anyway, let's keep going here. Now, what's important here is Aristotle states that antithesis in rhetoric is similar to a syllogism due to the presentation of two conclusions within a statement. So, in other words, you can prove a proposition through syllogism. You know, let's say uh, the proposition is if A, if A is true, then B is true, right? So then if your, your proof is A, you can therefore conclude B. That's known as a syllogism, straight syllogism. But the idea of using a compare, excuse me, a contrast is to say A does not equal B. Then you have uh, the proof is B. And what can you conclude? You conclude it's not A. That is using a, a contrast. The A does not equal B. And therefore, when the evidence is B, you can conclude it is not A. See, it's really quite a very effective means of reaching this uh, using. Uh, you can use antithesis to make a conclusion just as strong as you can if you use typical syllogisms. But actually, it's frankly, it's considered much more artful and more interesting to use contrast and actually more accurate. The reader, the listener will understand you better. That's what Aristotle said. So Aristotle was holding up as a much greater or higher thing is what was called antithesis, while who was the one who taught syllogisms? That was Plato. What was the, what was the advance of Aristotle? What was his big deal? Antithesis. So now you maybe get the idea you had Plato who taught very systematically just using syllogisms because that's the easiest way to know your proof is correct. You can just look at it on a you, you uh, graph it out. I took symbolic logic, a great thing I recommend people to study. And you basically can graph out syllogisms and prove your propositions by just relabeling them with letters, symbolic logic. That's what it's all about. 
then you can do the same thing with an antithesis. You just you just label them with letters, and then you come up and you can you can ironclad know you have reached a correct conclusion. And so some people, uh, you know, say, "How do you do all this, Doug?" Wow, oh, you know, hey, you got to study stuff like this. And symbolic logic is a good pastime if you have a, a, a some time. Just you can probably learn it all in about ten hours. And once you got it in your head, you just use it. And it's there. It's a tool you will always have in your brain forever and ever. Maybe one day we'll do an episode on symbolic logic. Uh, and that's how we don't, you never will make a mistake if you use it. Uh, antitheses are used to strengthen argument by using either exact opposites or simply contrasting ideas. So Paul, you, you, what I would say you can't say, and this is why maybe some people waffle about what 3738 are. They're not complete opposites. They're simply contrasting. In other words, is... Someone could say, if you believe what Paul said, it's no sin to uh, lie for the gospel, then some people might say, doesn't that mean we can lie, we can uh, 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 do evil that good may come? So, you know, the, so it, it's, they are, there is some comparison to them, but he's trying to draw them in antithesis. So you would think of, he he's so strongly condemning the latter that somehow there's something unique and different about lying for God's truth that puts it in a separate category, and therefore he is actually trying to prove by antithesis how far apart they are. He's willing to damn those who are. He's willing to say those who say doing evil that good may come are damned. He is clearly saying that is so far apart from where you're totally legally justified in God's eyes to lie, to spread His truth. Anyway. So I hope you can see now with a little more background with antithesis why we know what Paul is actually saying here. It's not even in doubt. And now I want to show you how many Bibles agree with me and or agree with this uh, easy reading version and or other versions as we'll see. All right, so let's ask ourselves, how many Bibles are willing to corrupt verse 7 in order to make fit it, 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 there's an, instead of a contrast, there's a comparison. Therefore, verses seven and eight are talking about the same uh, uh, false accusation in each case. Okay, that's what the, the. In other words, if you want to deflect verse seven, you've got to make it that it's a comparison with verse eight. So it's just another text that's saying the same thing. You have to add words. Some someone might argue, how many texts? say this. So I went through, Bible Hub gives you a, a single verse of all the main verses. And so the, the easy answer I'm going to show you ahead of time is three out of 44 Bibles, but I went through the whole thing. So just to show you, you can go through the things. So we got the NIV, which is supposed to be a literal text, which how many words is it adding? One, two, three. And then probably similar, there's seven words had to be added to verse eight in the English easy reading version we saw earlier. So presumably they've done something similar. And then over here you have, uh, I really should count this for more, but they've added a but, but, uh, but someone might still argue how can blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's, that's at least one, two, three, four there in that version. Now here's all the ones that do the right thing, which agree with me are nine, then amplified Bible, which is, uh, I guess it could be a deemed not a literal Bible. I don't know. It adds words, as you might say. That's not there, right? We've established that. So how many words? One, two, three, four. So there's two that have added four so far. One has added three, the NIV. So we're, th we're three Bibles in. And look at all the Bibles that agree with me. They're pounding out, pounding the sand, pounding away, pounding away, pounding away. Wow. Three out of 44, which is a, actually turns out to be 6%. So uh, why would only 6% agree with Giga? Because the truth is always stronger than a lie. It doesn't mean the truth always wins because the NIV is much more influential. All these other Bibles, even the King James had it right, right? Yeah, right. They've had them right. They're down here somewhere. Where's the King James Bible? And they, by the way, the English standard, here, here's the King James. They get it right. So they're not lying. They're not trying to defraud you. Okay, uh, one way you know something is shameful is if you can see that nobody wants to talk about it, just so you know. And uh, why, why, uh, why would Christians not want to talk about this passage? First, let's, let's, let's look at God's word, not Paul's word. A good introductory point on this topic is Proverbs 12, 10 in the NIV. 
the same book that adds those fraudulent words to change Paul's words around. It says the Lord condemns a crafty man. In Psalm verse five, chapter five, verse six, deceitful man, the Lord abhors. Jeremiah forty eight ten, and this is the worst of all for Paul. Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. That's what Paul is doing, he, and he defends it. I'm not. By the way, people say I called Paul a liar. Liar. No, he calls himself a liar in verse seven, and he says it's no sin. That's what it means in Greek if you know the text. So I didn't make it up. All right, now I want to show you that because it's such a shameful thing, nobody wants to talk about verse 3-7 three, three, in history. <clears throat> so whenever you want to find out what happened in the early church, what have people been saying about a verse, you go to earlychristianwritings.com. And look at here, 3-3 three, three, gap when you get from 3-5 to 3-8. There's nothing in 3-7. 3 8, it's easy to say someone is condemned and for whatever they're teaching that you can do evil that good may come. But what about 3 7, where he's de de definitely explaining being crafty for God is no sin? So there's not a single commentary in Romans 3 7 in the early church. Okay, so we're talking about probably before 350. Now, when uh, early Christian writings, I think, goes pretty much up to that, but we're going to see there's another book that came out. It's. Uh, um, oh, I, I can't remember what it is right now, but it's a book that takes all of the, what we'd say, the same thing early Christian writings is doing up to the 350s. It now does it in the period post-350 up to like the 1500s. And this book is 22,000 pages long. You can only buy it electronically, and it's not that expensive, so thankfully. So they'll give you the Bible verse so you can see what the context is. And so this covers uh, three seven. But if by my lie, God's truth abounds his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? So they have, they're not adding anything there. And why not say, just as some people slander who claim, we say, let us do what is evil so that it's good may come. And, and like I say, why is not the right? And it really should say, and I do not say, just as, just as people sometimes, as, as some people are slanderously claiming, we say, blah, 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 blah. So that's what it really says. And then... Here is, here is the what we would call the e catena, the chain of quotations on this. So he has like little notes on the, the individual words, but here we go. And that's it. So it goes from this list of little e catena chains, and now it's supposed to start what we call the e catena. And there's nothing on 3 1, th three, one to 1 7, empty. 3 9, okay, but nothing on 7. So. That's, uh, he'll talk about his opponents and so on, and and he's being blasphemed, or he he's trying to read it as a blasphemy of himself. <clears throat> or Ambrose, Ambrose Aster is trying to say people are blaspheming Paul with that attribution of that quote. That's true. That is what Paul is saying. But, uh, you know, that's all they want to talk about. They don't want to talk about what verse 3-7 says. How long is this going to go on in the church? Can people ignore the passage? Well, let's take a look a little further. Okay, well, let me suggest to you that the reason why we did not see it there for Ambrose Astor under 3.7 is itself suspicious. Because I, if you dig, 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 you'll get the book. It's a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Ambrose Astor, or it's really Bishop Ambrose of Milan. And so this is the book, Commentary on Romans and First and Second Corinthians, Ambrose Astor. It's really Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, but... Uh, Erasmus in the 1500s says, I'm not entirely sure it's Ambrose, despite a millennia of people thinking it was Ambrose of, uh, of Milan who wrote it. So all these academics just all fall into line and they're just going to call him, oh, we'll call him Ambrose the Aster, a person who writes like Ambrose. Anyway, let's take a look. He's going to talk about this verse and he's going to conclude what I tell you. What, it's, what, what is Paul saying? It's not a sin. It's not a sin. So this is what was the earliest and only commentary for all first 400 years of Christianity. But if through my falsehood, now this is a translation of exactly how Ambrose in the 380s read it. But if through my falsehood, God's truthfulness abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Now that's also a person translating Latin into Greek, uh, into English. Let's go on. Then this is this is a sole comment of, of uh, Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, on this verse. It is clear that if human sin benefits the glory of God by making it appear that he is the only one who is true, sinners would not be so called 
because they sin. For it would not be by their own will, but by God's impulse that they sinned, which is absurd. So in other words, they since they're proving God's truthfulness, they therefore are not sinning, and it, and they're doing it obviously by God's impulse, and, and and they could not there have sinned. So if it would not be by their own will, but by God's impulse that they sinned, which is absurd. So you cannot sin when you're doing God's will. Do you see what he's saying? So this person reads it just the way it reads. I'm reading it, and you should read it. And Paul meant it to be read. And that's the only voice in all of early Christianity who told you what it means. It means if you lie for the gospel, you have not sinned. That's false, but that's what the church understood. That's what Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, understood. And that's the only voice for the first 400 years on this particular passage. Now I'm going to present to you an, uh, a portion of this uh, six and a half minutes. I'm going to provide four minutes of it. Uh, the next two minutes that I'm not providing are him citing Paul saying, uh, self-congratulatory, you know, we've acted in all honor and decency towards you. And he's pr trying to say Paul advocates only honesty in dealing with people. And so 1 Corinthians 9 and 10 both contradict that, and I could go through that. But I want you to hear how somebody who's been completely deceived in the translation. These people don't claim to know Greek. They're going completely by the false translations, <clears throat> and they're relying upon some of the uh, the 6% of all the texts I showed you out of the 44, only three used this false translation that he has. And so he is actually cherry picking a translation that will help him make the argument and, that is not true in the original text. And, and uh, 41 out of the 44 would reject what he's saying. And he's, he's acting like it's preposterous. He then also slandering the people who uh, contradict this position by putting them in with the grouping of the Muslims and things like that, trying to associate uh, this point of view with Muslims somehow. So again, just pay attention to the game that's being played by these gentlemen and what I would have said to them is before you criticize, you got to go study Greek. You got to learn Greek. You got to make sure you're not cherry picking this, this exact words that you're relying upon to lead people falsely into an error. And you need, if you didn't even have even Greek background, you have to go look at the Mouncey transliteral or some transliteral to see if words have been added to the text you're relying upon before you accuse people of any dishonesty. So if, if if people are being dishonest, that's important. We need to call them out. But if, if you're actually being deceived and, and the people who gave you these translations are false, you need to say, hey, Paul does say this and Paul is, is defending lying. And so we better be careful about saying people are damned for teaching it's okay to uh, teach, to act falsely to promote the gospel. So let's listen to what he says with that in mind. Yeah, they're they're coming up faster than uh than I can uh than I can uh, mention them. Um, Romans three seven. Some would argue. Oh my goodness, that one. If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases His glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? So here, don't they're we still have, using that one? We, yeah, I know. I mean, it's it's a, it's a, it's got to be a. How are you not embarrassed when you put when you post something like that, right? So so the claim here, the claim here is that in Romans 3, 7, Paul says, uh, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? So here, Paul, isn't Paul saying that it's, it's, it's okay to lie? Wanna, okay, what well, do you think about that? Can we actually read just the very here. next verse? Here, I'll, no. I'll read it for you. Okay. <laughs> Let's just read. Okay, first of all, I'm going to start at verse 5. Now, now by the way, it, it, when, when you rip things out of context yeah. to that level, yeah. where he specifically yeah. he spe specifically says that he, he's not saying that, yeah. and then you just ignore that part, yeah. it becomes impossible to take you seriously. And, yeah, and, that's and why, just, yeah. just, just to be clear, um, when Muslims use these kinds of arguments, it, it, let, let me put it this way. There, there, there are two kinds of people who might use that verse. One, there are people who actually read the chapter, <laughs> see that Paul is saying the yeah. exact opposite of that, That's right. and then deliberately lie about it because they, they know that they can use this to lie. Yeah. And there are Muslims who haven't read the chapter. They just hear their Muslim, their Muslim friend or their, their Muslim imam quoting this, and they think 
they think that, that they're accurately check. representing what yeah. Paul said. Yeah. So either deceptive people or completely ignorant people. Those are the only yeah. two people who could, who could use that yeah. to claim exactly. that that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. What was it, what, what's he really saying in context? Okay, there? let's read it. Romans, eight, uh, Romans 3, I'm sorry, 5 to 8. I'll start at 5, but mm -hmm. 8, he gives you the answer. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. He's clearly mm -hmm. saying, someone may object, well, if my unrighteousness <clears throat> brings about God's righteousness. It displays that God is righteous in judging and punishing evildoers. Then why is he angry with me? After all, I'm helping him look good. Basically, that's the argument. Paul is not saying that's his argument. That's the argument of a potential objector, like an atheist would do. And so now Paul is anticipating the objection and refuting it. But let's continue. Certainly not, right? If that were so, how could judge God judge the world? Someone might argue. If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases His glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? In other words, if my sins <clears throat> can be used by God to bring Him greater glory in demonstrating His justice or His holiness or His mercy, then why does God find fault when I sin when it helps Him look good? Notice response. Why not say as some slanderous, slanderously claim that we say? Did you catch it? People are falsely accusing us of saying this. Let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. The very next verse Paul tells you, this is not my position. This is not my stance. This is not my argument. It's the argument of someone who may use this against me in my preaching. I'm anticipating it, responding to it. And he says, those who accuse me of saying that this is my stance, let me lie in order to make God look good, then they deserve condemnation. They deserve God's judgment. Could Paul be any clearer that he's not saying, this is my position, that my lying <clears throat> brings about God's glory, so I continue to lie to make God more glorious. That's not what he's saying in context. Okay, so I think you can see that uh, these gentlemen, the one thing they did do wrong is they cherry-picked, obviously, one out of uh, three possible versions in the 44 listed on Bible Hub that you could find that had these extra words in verse 7 and then the change in the beginning of verse 8 so it could all fit together. So these are people who themselves are what? Self-deluded, and they're going to go with whatever has what they think is the softest effect on Paul. But the truth is the other 41 versions are correct, and Paul does mean what he says in verse 7. He's not saying some may say that is a false addition. And he is carving that out as his domain that he can do that. He can lie for the gospel, and that's no sin. It's like to him, it's like a duh moment. But I'm not saying what these people say is that we should do evil so good should come. Well, of course, that's wrong. Those people who uh, who teach that are damned. <laughs> so that's not uh, what Paul is uh, uh, teaching. And he sees that in contradiction or contradistinction or antithesis from verse 3 7. So I had a second question here is why do a few Bibles engage in a fraudulent cover up? So you got three Bibles that are on Bible Hub, and then there that was that uh, easy reading version or whatever. And I mean, oh my gosh, 10 extra words and two taken out. I mean, it's just unbelievable rewriting of scripture. Why are they doing it? Because the, here's the irony the, those three Bibles that all do that the three in the Bible Hub, and this one from Easy Reading, they all know that Paul does mean Romans 3, 7. Because what on earth would justify them themselves to deceive you and me what the verse actually says? Because they have to do 10 extra words, take two out and add 10? Come on. They know they're lying. They know they're deceivers. And the only reason they can get, they think they can justify the God is that if they told the truth, it might make people less wanting to follow Paul and we, we have to protect Paul at all costs. So we are going to lie for the gospel of Paul. And that's why we're going to take out 10 words and add put two, uh, we're going to add 10 words and we're going to take two words out. So the very fact they did it is the proof that they know it was true. And the underlying text, the other 41 versions are correct. That, that, but they're taking the extra step of taking a precaution to protect you and me from the truth to deceive these poor, these gentlemen or give them this plausibility that there's one, you know, one out of 6% of the Bibles agree with us, and all, yeah, 94% are against us, but we're going to go with the 6% the, the that we can cite, yay! 
that's not a guy that is not doing anything appropriate. And by the way, when you see something like that, then you have to know Greek. You have to be able to do a translation. You have to be able to be objective and not try to find what go, uh, agrees with you, but find out what it actually says first and then try to figure out why it says what it says. But so many people do it the other way around. I want it to fit my viewpoint, blah, 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 blah. People say, I want to find things that fit my viewpoint. As I said, this whole thing with Paul, I was trying to squeeze Paul into believing he didn't think eternal security was true. And I, I did everything I could with the Bible, but I eventually said that's that's impossible. He does believe in eternal security. He, he contradicts Jesus who says, no, a believer in me has two choices. You can go to heaven maimed or hell whole. Mark 9, 42, 47. That was my reason why I had to look at Paul objectively. So I didn't want to see it. I wanted to see it the other way. And I came out on the other side, which, it, which was I only had one person left. That's Jesus. And Paul was gone because you can't have two voices saying opposite things from each other. Paul says you're eternally secure. You're going to heaven just for belief in facts. Jesus says absolutely not. You can go to heaven named or hell whole. It's just that stark. Matthew, uh, Mark 9, verses 42 to 47. It's also in uh, Matthew 18. I think it's verses six to nine. Anyway, I hope that helps everybody uh, to to realize that uh, Mark, uh, excuse me, uh, Romans three verse seven it does say what it means. Paul does mean what he says, and it's uh, and he's not damning himself here. He's not pointing the finger back at himself in verse eight. He's literally he's excusing himself. In fact, that's why it's an antithesis. He's saying. I, doing what I'm doing, lying for the gospel is a good thing. Don't get on my back for that. But I'm not going as far as saying that, you know, we should just do sin so that even my, uh, you know, so that uh, good may come. That's not what I'm saying. And, and that's a damnable heresy. And I would never say that. That's what he's trying to tell you. So let's leave him where he is. Don't make him, don't make him uh, different than he's saying. Leave it as it is. And then you have to decide, is it uh, 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 God says uh, a worker who works the uh, Jeremiah says the one who works the works of God deceitfully is a, a abomination to God. Should we follow what Jeremiah says or follow what Paul says? That's what really what it comes down to. We have some decisions to make, but let's make them after we translate the passages correctly. All right, everybody, God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye. 